Sweet. Um, like I said, my name is Hogan Tan, and right now, whether you like it or not, you're subconsciously judging me. Maybe perhaps even actively judging me. So um, it's part of our subconscious. We've developed it. It's a survival technique. We just feel more comfortable around people that we look like and act like. That's why we have cultures. That's why we have cultural barriers. I mean, it's a survival technique, nonetheless. But in this world of globalization, you know, that starts to hinder efficiency. It starts to hinder this global culture that we're starting to develop. Like, and just to demonstrate how people stereotype and just to give you a little perspective on the idea, just imagine if I wasn't an ABC, an Asian-born Chinese. What if, what if I was black? What if I was standing here in front of you, not as a seminar speaker? What if I was just some kid in the corner? Would you say hi to me? If I asked you out, would, would that be weird? If I was, what if I was Caucasian? What if I just, would you feel more comfortable around me? How would you react to that? What if we were here? Or what if we were in China? I mean, what if I, like, right now you're dissecting the way that I speak, you're dissecting my body language, you're dissecting what I'm wearing, you're dissecting how I'm acting, how I'm addressing the audience, who I'm looking at, why is my presentation so suck-ass right now that it's just white with some text on it. Like, you got all these play into subconscious judging of people. And I'm saying that's a bad thing, but on a, on a level that I'm seeing now, it's a societal level and how Congress is reacting to racial issues and ethnic issues, racial stratification, um, whether it be economical or based on race, it's utterly complete bullshit. And honestly, it should piss you off. It should really piss you off. You know, judging little kids by their race. Every time you fill in a race bubble, you are being judged. You're so kind of being judged. You're being labeled. So you're not only a, just a statistical number to the government, you are um, part of something, some race that they're just going to subclass. So the Board of Education in Florida has just passed, actually not just passed, but has actually started to implement um, this this um, this system where uh, state schools get funding based on academic <coughs> test scores, but they have different test score requirements for race. So you have to have 92% of your Asian kids at or above reading level and math level, 88% of your um, Caucasian kids, 82% of your blacks, and 84, I think 84, 83% of your Latinos. And that's down in Florida, one of the most diverse states. And <laughs> what's surprising is not the first state to implement it. West Virginia did it first. So just stuff like that, affirmative action, and just these um, just lame duck, band-aid, or broken arm um, solutions by Congress and society and how we label people and how we subconsciously judge people based on their looks, um, it should really piss you off. And it really pisses me off because it's like trying to solve a Rubik's Cube. It's not the Rubik's Cube's fault if you can't solve it. It's not that person's fault if you are ignorant to their background that you don't like that person. It's not their fault. It's because you're ignorant. Don't blame other people's closed-mindedness on. Don't blame your closed-mindedness on other people, and that's what I'm going to show you. Show you today, and um, one one thing that I would love to um, describe is my my outlook on life, my perspective on life, and because it plays a very straight role in my argument against combating this problem of stereotyping, being ignorant towards other people's cultures, and that is to look at art, and quite simply, um, the Earth is just. Eh, without art, like literally, if you just take the spelling of it, you know, you take the art out in the middle, and it's just eh. So, and um, being able to communicate like this, even though it's very simple in nature, this artist, I feel his commentary is very, is very compelling and profound because he is demonstrating the what I feel is the crux to be human. This this condition of being human that we refer to. What is it that philosophically? What does it mean to be a human being? Now, I'm not talking about genetics, I'm not talking about anything, I'm talking about philosophically what defines us as a race. And that's the ability, not for an individual to individual to communicate, but for a generation to a generation to communicate. That's the, like, have you noticed that we're the only species on this entire planet that has found a way to communicate from the grave? When the individuals of one generation die, we can still take their technology, their ideas, their ideals, their morals, their perceived truths, and we can propel them and use it as foundation to our technology, our ideals. So what this enables us to do is go above species that can't do this. You know, every single time, um, say like elephants, whales, insects, whatever, what have you, bacteria, their genetic code, natural selection might take over, but their technology, their ideas, what one individual has found a solution to a problem doesn't necessarily get propagated outside of their body. But we as humans, have found this trait of communication, language, recording history. And that is what sets us apart from animals. 
So in my eyes, the ability to communicate effectively is not only a necessary trait to become successful, but it's a necessary trait to be human, to be called human in, in the society that we call um, this social contract that we engage in that con constructs our society. And without art, art is the most basic concept of this communication. It's how we communicate to the generations before us. Um, just like ancient art. You see, um, here's Miyamoto Musashi and his book of Five Rings. It's one of the most influential books in martial arts and is actually interpreted nowadays for CEOs and how to navigate the market and gouge profit and remain in the black. This is the Rosetta Stone, crux of all translation technologies here. There's actually a data, there's actually, you know, that the thing that you learn, learn how to immerse, in, immerse yourself in cultures and learn languages and it's called Rosetta Stone. This is the actual thing that's based off of, which translated ancient Greek texts into Egyptian and other languages. On uh, Terracotta Army, we can see glimpses into what was. This is a, a depiction of Bodhidharma bringing martial arts to the Buddhist temples while he crossed from India into China in what we refer to as now the Shaolin version of Kung Fu. And we also see, you know, written ideals, notions, perceived truths in the Quran. Um, or we just see the Mona Lisa, a commentary on Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci is one of the most famous works. A commentary on society, a satire at that time. And so from these uh, pieces of art, we can decipher ideas, ideals, and perceived truths that were held at one point in time. And it's, and it's amazing because these guys died hundreds and hundreds of years ago. If you look at any other species, no other individuals in any other species have ever done this feat, ever. To record ideas and ideals or some type of communication to future generations other than the genetic material. We're the only species specific to that. And so that is what makes us human. And even today, we still use art to solidify our ideals and perceptions. Um, obviously, uh, if you don't recognize these works, shame on all of you, because this is Banksy, one of the most gifted artists of our time. So he's a prolific graffiti artist, and he has art all over the world. He's UK based, but art all over the world. And just his basic concepts of art and his technical and he's very technically good at art, very technically based, and he definitely is a <coughs> modern artist. But um, what I want to point out is his most interesting works and most profound works are at the West Gaza Strip. I mean, that wall that separates the Israelis from the Palestinians. He actually goes up to the wall with, you know, with patrol officers, with automatic weapons, and he graffitis these pieces on there, depicting scenes other sides, because it's a very huge form of racism. It's almost like that the northern in um, border of India where the Muslims meet the Hindis. Um, it's a very conflict heavy um, area and he just goes up to these walls and he just does his art. A political commentary on how just complete bullshit that stereotyping is and how that how can you hate someone who looks exactly like you and has many of the same ideals but just because they come from a different lineage because you haven't been able to solve their Rubik's Cube you just hate them, categorically exclude, exclude them from your life would not not even looking at them. And so he paints these pictures of paradise on the other wall. And probably the girl with the balloons is probably his most famous work. And not only, like, there's other artists that also, so I include this guy, uh, JR. He's actually the owner of the largest um, art gallery, illegal, albeit. But he goes up, he takes pictures of just normal people. And what he did was he took pictures in this particular instance, Israelis and Palestinians, and he just posted them up all, of, all, all on the wall. And people liked it so much that, and it also pissed off so many people, that he did it in many Palestinian and Israeli cities all over the place. And when he was doing this, when he was approached by patrol cops and other people, he simply asked them, can you tell the difference? Can you tell the difference? Can you even tell if this is an Israeli or a Palestinian? And the person wouldn't know. And he said, well, I'm just posting up pictures of whatever nationality he was, that city that he was in. So he was so this is a huge political commentary in which, again, I want you to take away from this. Artists are communicating their ideas so when, you know, when we're long and gone and dead, these will still be there. And what future generations will see is these held truths and ideals in that maybe we're approaching society wrong. And that's what I want you to take away from art in that we're trying to eliminate um, this ignorance and that we're trying to communicate ideas to future generations. That is what the true essence of art is. So, pretty much, art is simply a freeze frame 
of a set of ideas or ideals or perceived truths held at one certain point in time and place. And the quality of art is dependent on the artist's ability to compel us to think. However, take that with a caveat. I would like to say this, that ignorance is the main problem in that it is not the artist's ability nowadays that just completely cripples good art. It is the ability of society to think in general. That is what I think is the pro problem with society today. It's because of ignorance, this huge problem of ignorance and that people are not aware, closed minded that is the real problem of why people can't truly enjoy great art. And I will, and I'll have some examples, but just in the most simplest form, this right here is the earliest form of art that I could find. Some guy, some man, our ancestor, had, this is dated at 10,000 BC, some guy had the proclivity, the capacity, to just simply spray his handprint on the wall. And now, many of you might think, oh, that, that's just cave paintings, whatever. But no, this is the demonstration of the only species on the planet that has the capacity to think that, hey, maybe I should, instead of marking my territory just for this generation, maybe I should make something more permanent for future generations to know. And to me, pretty much the, these two are the same thing. Declaration of Independence with John Hancock. These are the people's John Hancocks. And pretty much they paved the way for the written language. This communication, this condition of being human. This is, this is what true art is. Simplistic, yes. But at that turning point and when we were starting to become societies and civilizations, this is what enabled us to become what we are today. Simple caveman paintings. This idea of communication. And so I'll demonstrate this idea of ignorance and how um, ignorance is really the key to not recognizing good art. And when you don't recognize good art, you don't appreciate the beauty in life. And when you don't appreciate the beauty in life, you never find happiness. And when you don't find happiness, well, what's the point of living? So I mean, it's all a circle. So here we go. Everybody knows, everybody knows eating, all right? It's one of the basic functions of life. If you don't eat, you're going to die. So we're pretty not um, ignorant to eating. So everybody knows that this is a medium rare to rare cooked steak. And when you see this, this is a thing of beauty, especially if you're a graduate student, okay? <laughs> free seminar lunch, bam, free food. That's something we can understand in its beauty. Again, Sam Colt, the saying goes, God created men, Sam Colt made them equal. Many can appreciate the value of a gun. When someone has a gun, you appreciate the beauty and you respect the elegance of a gun. However, maybe not so much, maybe like just because this is outside the bubble of America, you don't recognize this. Now you say, oh, that's some cool architecture. That's, that's pretty cool, dude. But this is actually top 10 green agriculture projects of 2008. This is actually um, the Polytechnic Institute of Engineering in Singapore, which is one of the top engineering institutes in the world. Again, Another idea of ignorance. Many of you would think that this is a pretty, um, pretty even fight. Maybe the guy on top has the advantage. But anybody that is well versed in jujitsu would know that this guy on top is screwed because this guy on the bottom has the perfect position for Gogo Plata, in which he's got both arm control. This this leg is going to swing over this right shoulder, and this arm is going to come over the top of this his neck here, crank down on the neck, and crush this guy's windpipe on this shin bone right here. So. A lot of you are ignorant of that fact, and that you don't recognize the beauty in this in this art right here of jujitsu. And even even more so, um, maybe if I went around Clemson and showed this little poem, it looks like it was scrawled by a high schooler. Um, this is the rose that grew from concrete. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is actually um, this is actually the poem that Tupac wrote, and this is the basis of a lot of social movements, um, especially back in the 1990s when. The Black Panther movement started to die down, but racial equality started to surface again. This was a huge um, piece, piece of literature. And even in science and engineering, a lot of us are bioengineers in here, um, a lot of people would, would look at this like, oh, what's that, high school of failing algebra? No, this is actually Mendeleev's notes on when he predicted elements that didn't even exist yet for the periodic table. Again, this right here, this little, these little black splurges and everything that most people would not recognize, if you were ignorant to the idea and didn't study biology, you wouldn't know that this is the central dogma of biology. This is how Watson and Crick determined the double helix structure of DNA. This is what all modern medicine is based off of. <coughs> and again, a lot of you wouldn't even know what this is, but this is an op-amp controller that's in every single one of your cell phones and is the basis for logic digital signal transduction. So, don't be ignorant. That is my first 
first key tenet I want to convey you, don't be ignorant. And just because something confuses you at first, don't blame that thing and categorically exclude it from your life. Because that's what, I know it sounds funny, but that's what a lot of people do. And so, how I want to demonstrate this is tattoo stigma. So we're going to look at a case report. If we can apply these, these things, this idea of not being ignorant to ideas, maybe we can apply them to people. So what if I told you that 25% of people are actually tattooed nowadays? From the age range of 25, um, above 18, and between 18 and 25, 25% of this age group is actually tattooed now. What if, like how would your perceptions change? Like what if um, someone who was tattooed asked you out on a date? Would you actually accept it? Versus how would you, how would you um, rate your approachability or reproachability towards a person if they were tattooed? Because I mean, like, do you, do you view me as an approachable person, right? How would that change if you knew that I was tattooed? Because I mean, I actually am tattooed. If you, can t you can't really tell now, but not a lot of Asian people are tattooed. And, <laughs> but I will show you that I am heavily tattooed, and that not all tattoo stigmas are real. And, that, uh, and we see that because a lot of employers don't want tattoos. You have to keep. Why, why do we have to keep tattoos covered in the workplace if they don't really, if, if we don't really judge people on them? So that says to me we do judge people on tattoos and their outward appearance. And um, I think that's due to ignorance. You don't really understand the culture of tattooing because tattooing is not correlated with any character attribute. It's actually the direct opposite. The tattoos don't make a person. The person makes the tattoos. And so I'd like to get this, do a little case report and do a little study and a little delve into tattoo history to kind of alleviate some of these tattoo students and see, judge your perception of tattoos before and right now versus five minutes later from now. So, tattooing, what is going on? Well, meet Otsi, he's a mummy, 3300 BC, and um, he has the first visual signs of tattooing, and um, he was, he had a lot of bone degradation here by his vertebra, so Probably this was due to some type of, they believe that it would heal him. So these are tattoo lines discovered on the preserved mummy, 3300 BC. This predates any religion or honestly any civilization to be, to be that matter. And then in 2200 BC, we see Egyptians um, tattooing women in the efforts to increase fertility because they believe they would increase fertility. And then here we see a Scythian man, the ice man, right here, and with uh, depictions of animal spirits, and this is probably due to social status. And in 980, even in Peruvian um, culture, we see status tattoos depicted on here. And so while during the nine, 900s on, um, as, re, as the rise of religions happened, the tattoo world became sequestered in those regions. However, they flourished in many other regions, like Micronesia and Polynesian culture, we see tattoos still used today to indicate status and um, honestly rites of passage. So the more tattoos you have, the more events in your life that are significant that have happened. So um, this is an ink, this is a moko. It's called a moko face mask, and it's used to indicate social status within that culture. And the actual word tattoo actually comes from Polynesian culture, in that tata meaning to repeatedly and u meaning to draw. So when imperialism happened, they brought these tattooed people to back to the um, empires in Europe, and that's how the word tattoo came to origin. And we even see in Thailand um, traditional tattooing. And interesting thing about this, so you actually don't get to, you just go to Thailand, you talk to a monk, and he decides if you're worthy of a tattoo. And the catch is, you don't get to decide the image of where it goes. And so this is a tattoo in the direct essence of tattooing, in that these it's believed to protect you from bad spirits. But, um, so the Western culture kind of ignored tattoos. Other cultures embraced tattoos to indicate social status. Other, other cultures were on the <coughs> especially Japan. Japan, um, Lost Samurai would get tattoos and just have these huge floral ink patterns, very colorful, and it indicates social status. However, in 300 AD, they started marking criminals with tattoos, so tattoos just had a bad taboo. And in, um, during the Edo period, when the common class started becoming affluent again, people started getting tattoos again to curb this um, tattoo. However, in 1870, Japanese government, to fit in better with the Western world, banned all tattoos. 
So all of a sudden, all these common folk people who were affluent, all of a sudden had to go underground. And that's how the Yakuza clan was born. Um, one of the biggest, biggest clans and um, gangs in the world. And um, still today, this horimono, as it's called, full body tattoo, which takes about 10 to 15 years to complete, is still used as a rite of passage. And there are no mechanical needles used in this process. It is just a stick with about um, a dozen razor sharp needles on it, and this guy's just poking at your skin for like five hours. No, no nothing. And it takes usually 10 to 15 years if you do two to three sits at five hours of peach each week. So it's not a, in, definitely in a rite of passage in its own right. But um, how did tattoos come into the U.S.? U.S., I'm obviously just... It came with this individualistic group movement that we had in the U.S. In the Roaring Twenties, people started going out to war, coming back, seeing other cultures, and just saying, you know what, this bubble that we live in is just complete utter bullshit. So we're going to get tattoos. And that's what they said. They pretty much said YOLO, and they got, went out and got some tattoos. But, and you know, at first, you know, these tattoos are kind of the first flash art tattoos, the traditional tattoo marks. But um, these are very common, you know, you see... Um, the state of the Navy, pirate ships, a lot of ships sailing out to represent freedom. But um, during the 1960s, the Women's Liberation Front started to really kick in gear. And that's what really brought tattoos to the forefront. Because a lot of women started getting tattoos and started delving into more um, artistic pieces. However, you also have the contrast with prison culture. Um, prison cultures obviously use tattoos to mark, mark themselves as a gang insignation. It's, like, it's almost like their logo, their signature. And so, um, obviously the media portrayed this. This got women's liberation. You just saw a bunch of liberals and professional women talking. But prisoners, they would always comment on the tattoos. So that's why tattoos has such a bad stigma nowadays. Because it's associated with crime. And honestly, you just don't look normal. <coughs> or what the per media perceives um, people to be normal. So that's what the that's what the stigma is today, but I would like to tell you that, you know, this is like, when you see these prison tattoos, they are not, like, this is not real tattooing. Tattooing as an art is this, you know, huge portrait pieces, huge, um, huge artistic designs. And you can see that, again, this is a form of art. You know, these are ideals, ideal notions of perceived truths being formed and frozen on time on the living canvas. You're a walking museum. So hopefully I've alleviated some of the stigmas behind tattooing and learned a little history and not become ignorant to it. So obviously you have some normal tattoos, you know, haha, -ha, sense of humor. But, you know, you also have very dear tattoos to you. So um, obviously memorial tattoos, um, commemorative tattoos, and even, you know, tattoos of a, of a past that you might not want to really relive. So these are, hol that's a Holocaust tattoo, because a Holocaust survivor. So what really prevents us from really living together in a culture is this idea of ignorance. Because we don't have, um, a lot of people don't perceive the way I do, or many of you in the room, I don't believe that you are really ignorant people, but um, hope that hopefully you, I broaden your minds and that you take on a different approach to life and that you find some type of beauty in everything. But don't be so careless as to be taken for believe in charlatans and don't be dope. Um, keep an open mind, but keep a critical mind. And that's the key to being enlightened. And I'd like to end my talk today with some quotes from the most enlightened person that I've ever um, witnessed on YouTube. Uh, his, um, his Holiness um, answered when he was asked, what surprises you most about man? And this is what His Holiness had to say. He simply said, man itself. Because he sacrifices health in order to make money. Then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. And then he is so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he is never going to die. And then dies as if having never really lived. And so that's a very profound quote from an enlightened individual that I feel has a lot of insight. And he has 18 rules how to live your life. And I've selected three, so I'm not going to read to you.